Welcome to another Genesis study as we get into Genesis chapter 12. And uh, we've completed what we could call the introduction to the Bible with the first 11 chapters. It tells us how we get from creation up to the main family, Abraham. And then from this point on, we're going to be on a journey following the chosen seed from Abraham to Jesus. And if you keep that in mind, number one, it'll never get boring for you. When you see the stories were given, the stories told, a lot of times you're being told how Satan is trying to kill off this family, this genetic line, this lineage. And he, several times he thinks he succeeds. So it gets really interesting as we go through the rest of the Bible. And there's no other book like it, folks. And if you don't know that, you just stick around. And uh, every study we do, I have people respond and say, Wow, I didn't know that. I didn't know. It's not, it doesn't have anything to do with this teacher. It has to do with that book. And all we have to do is be faithful to open up the Bible and to study it carefully, to uh, rightly divide the word of truth. I'm going to start out with a hillbilly holler out to my dentist, Dr. Charles Monaghan at Smiles Ahead Dentistry, and uh, that's in the northern Franklin County, Columbus, Ohio area. If you need a dentist, I highly recommend him. As you can see, I still have all my teeth. He does a real good job. I've been going to him for a number of years. My wife's gone to him even longer, and he's a brother in Christ. And so when we get out a hillbilly holla, we know he listens because... Uh, he asked me some questions about a couple of the uh, studies we've done, so that's great. Now, uh, let's get into our study, but we always want to start with a word of prayer. And we ask, Father, Lord, that you'd just help us in our study to maintain a clarity of mind and, and uh, really allow ourselves to get caught up in this story, this uh, historic uh, event, this uh, unfolding of your plan through the ages. It's an amazing thing that you've given us in this book that people just don't seem to comprehend how amazing it is many times. But I pray everyone involved with this study would have the right attitude and understand just how incredible this is. All for your glory and your honor as we journey through the Bible, seeing how you brought Jesus Christ into this world to die for our sins and that he was buried but rose again the third day according to the scripture. And we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Uh, jumping right in, verse 1, you're going to see that what the news media calls the land of Palestine, um, biblically it's Judea, but it is the promised land. And it was given to Abraham, Abram and then Abraham, name changed there slightly, then to Isaac, and then to Jacob, and then divided among the twelve sons of Jacob who made up the nation of Israel. And that, of course, is contrary to the anti-Semites who lie and teach that the promise was only to Abraham and didn't go any further. And it's nonsense. And folks, I'm telling you, they're liars. I have shown them point-blank, black-and-white words of God, and they don't care. It's not about the truth for them. They have a satanic spirit of hatred for the Jew. Satan hates the Jew. Satan hates Israel. Yes, he hates Jesus Christ. Yes, he hates the Christians. But Bible prophecy rests not only on Jesus Christ and the Christians, but on that land and the prophecies God has given about how that he is going to bring all those Jews back to that land for judgment. The time of Jacob's trouble uh, during the time that, that Jesus described as great tribulation. And during that period of seven years, the 70th week of Daniel, Israel, the people, not the church, which is the anti-Semites try to replace Israel with the church. It's not the church, it's Israel. And Israel, the flesh and blood apostate nation, back in the land, is judged, but then saved at the end of that seven-year period when Messiah, Jesus Christ, returns. And when he saves a third, according to Zechariah, it's a third that will be saved, 
that one third will go into the millennium and there will be a nation of Israel that Jesus Christ will rule and reign from. He'll sit on a throne in Jerusalem and rule and reign from Israel, the whole world, all the nations of the world. He will literally be King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And Folks, you have to see that. That's the purpose for what we're studying here. If you get into Bible study and you don't see the big picture, then you miss it all. And that's where we're at as we begin in verse 1. It says, Now the Lord had said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred and from thy father's house unto a land that I will show thee. Now we just kind of breeze through that. But could you imagine being told that? Like, you know, there have been people who have done this, a lot of missionaries, but uh, I have never done it. Uh, God didn't tell me to completely get away from everything I knew uh, and go to a land I didn't know. When I moved to Columbus, Ohio, it was just about two hours away from where I grew up. I spent almost my entire life, except for a few months in Florida, I spent my entire life in southern Ohio, and then I moved a couple hours north, and any time I wanted to, I could jump in my car, as long as I had gas money, and go visit family. And that's not the, that's not the case when it comes to Abram. He is leaving everything behind, and we talked about where he's come from, Ur of the Chaldees, which is in the uh, area of Iraq today, Babylon. And uh, he's going to simply go, and he has no idea where he's going. And you notice that the land doesn't belong to uh, the Canaanites either. We're going to see that in Deuteronomy 11, Jeremiah 2.7, and elsewhere, it's clear it's God's land. In Deuteronomy 11, I believe it's verse 12, it talks about how he watches over this land. He loves this land. In Jeremiah 2.7, he's talking and he says, it's my land. And God has given this land to the Jew through Abraham and his promise to Abraham and his seed through Isaac and Jacob. But the land ultimately, and the say-so, belongs to God. He doesn't give a flip what the United Nations thinks or what a bunch of Hollywood actors think or what a bunch of Arabs think. And so uh, we already see he's telling Abram about this land. And uh, verse 2 says, And I will make of thee a great nation, and I will bless thee and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. So uh, you see this fourfold promise here, uh, and we're going to run through that in a minute. But you, I want to come back to this about the land and how it, it, it relates to the fact that this is about a king and a kingdom. A kingdom is a land, a land that has a king. So it's about a kingdom, and the kingdom has land, and the kingdom has a king, and the king has subjects, and the subjects uh, serve the king, while the king also has enemies. And uh, the time is coming when this kingdom that's going to exist on this land will be ruled by the King Jesus, and he will rule as King of all kings and Lord of all lords. And he, Read Revelation 19 if you want a reminder. He wins. In verse 2, we see a fourfold promise to Abraham, or Abram at this time. It, and there's no sin in interchanging those names. I'm known as Greg and Gregory. Uh, Abram and Abraham are the same man. But it has a lot to do with understanding the timing of the uh, covenant and, and so forth. But it says that he would become a great nation. And that was true uh, during David's day, uh, up till the, after the death of Solomon, when his foolish son Rehoboam uh, listened to the youngsters and split the kingdom. It'll also be true during the millennial kingdom itself. During the 1,000 years, this promise will be fulfilled. Israel will be a great nation, and they will rule and reign over uh, an area, at the nation itself. And I believe King David will sit on a throne in the millennium over Israel. Jesus is king of all kings and lord of all lords, and that will include the King David over Israel, which the land of Israel at that time will go all the way from the Euphrates, all the way over there where Iraq is, and down uh, as far as the Euphrates goes into the Gulf, all the way over to uh, the Nile. And that whole area, from the Mediterranean to the Euphrates, and all points in between there uh, along uh, those borders. You can get maps online if you want to see a visual, and it is quite a visual. I recommend you do that so you can see that. And 
it says also in verse 2, I will bless thee, meaning it's, it's, there's a perpetual blessing upon Abraham and his uh, offspring. Now, it is true that it is conditioned on the, on the fact that it, while they are uh, not in apostasy, while they are following God, but the, the blessing is there at all times. Same thing's true as Christians. We are saved, and we have all these wonderful blessings that are ours. But when we're not living um, lives according to the Word of God, not walking in the Spirit, not serving the Lord, He's not going to allow those blessings to trickle down on, and, and for you to experience those at that time, even though they are your possession and you have a right to them. And it's, it's you know, there's other analogies you can use for that. Uh, you can uh, say you have a bank account with a million dollars in it and your name is yours, but if you don't have the account number or, or you don't have the wherewithal or memory of that uh, blessing, then it's practically it's not yours at that moment, even though it does belong to you. And that's how Christians and Jews have lived. You see Christians who just, they're ignorant of the blessings of God and they don't really live in the full blessing that God wants them to have. And you have Jews, you know, that if they would turn to Messiah, they'd have all these blessings from God. And yet, as long as they're in apostasy, that the blessing is a reality that hangs over their head where God wants them to have it. And it is theirs by right if they will simply uh, turn to Him. It says also that uh, I will make of thee a great name. And, and Abraham, the name of Abraham, is known around the world. And he's called the father of the three, three of the great world religions, Christianity, Islam, and uh, Judaism. And actually, he's not the father of, <laughs> of Islam. Uh, Muhammad made that up and pulled it out of his rear end. And uh, it had these <clears throat> demonic, devil-inspired uh, uh, visions during his uh, fits that he was had having, like... Um, you see on these movies with, with uh, devil possession and as described in the Bible, the devil possessed people. That's what Muhammad looked like, acted like, and that's how he came up with his religion. Don't blame Abraham for that. But it's still a fact that all those Muslims claim Abraham and his name is great. So even if a lot of it is perpetuated on lies, his name is great and that fulfills um, this promise. And then uh, Israel itself if you want to see how this promise goes through Isaac and Jacob and Israel, the same thing. I mean, all around the world, almost on a nightly basis, they're talking about Israel. Then it says, uh, Thou shalt be a blessing. And that's been true as well. We don't have time to run through all this, but it's a fascinating study about um, the wealth that's been created by the Jews. And anywhere um, that the Jews have lived, even though they've always been a tiny percentage of that population, they've been a blessing. But then, um, uh, well, let me go on. They, they not only create wealth, but they invent and innovate like no one else. And uh, Israel today is the uh, uh, hub of uh, uh, technology and innovation. And the twist on that is that people get jealous and, and they don't like the Jews because they see the Jews are doing so well. And that's what Nazi Germany, you know, they... They turn on the Jews and they blame them for the uh, Treaty of Versailles. And Versailles was the reason why uh, Germany was so poor. But then when you looked over and you saw the Jews doing so well because of this promise, the Bible-ignorant, Christ-rejecting, apostate German looked and blamed them for the problems they were suffering, saying, look at those Jews, they're taking all of our money and and hoarding up everything, and that wasn't really the case. The same things happen with plagues. The Bible tells um, the Jew, you know, to wash with running water and to go out and bury their dung outside of the camp, and they do that so they have historically had less disease and and um, and plagues and things. Uh, whereas the Gentiles, who you know hated the Jews and ignored the Old Testament, they didn't follow that um, cleanliness. Uh, rule that was set down in the Old Testament and so it promoted illness and a lot of times that was what the plagues were all about and um, you'd have the rats running around eating all the excrement and everything and the, that the people were just throwing out in the yard and then they would 
ec they would have their excrement, which would turn to powder and, and, and float in the air, and then people would breathe it, and they would have respiratory illness, and, and that was the Black Death and all that stuff. It's just, uh, it, but they blamed the Jew because the Jews over there he wouldn't let him live with them. They lived off separate, and they weren't dying off, so they blamed the Jew. And that's the insane mentality that's followed the Jews around, um, you know, their entire existence. And but you know, it's a reminder they've rejected their Messiah by and large, and so um, they have the. The blessing of God is theirs, and they receive, and they they demonstrate a lot of times. But it's also, they are void of His uh, protection, and they suffer many times simply because of the fact they've rejected Jesus Christ, and that's ultimately going to be what causes them to suffer the way they will, and they're about to suffer uh, during the great tribulation, when the Lord allows the Antichrist and and the rest of the world to basically kill off two-thirds of all the Jews that exist. So, uh, ver we continue verse 3, and it says, I will bless them that bless thee, and curse him that curseth thee, and in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. And this is one of the most important Bible verses in uh, Scripture, but the, of course the Jew haters hate it. And they'll come out and say, oh, that's not talking about all Jews. That's just talking about Abram. Well, we already seen that this is about not only Abram, but the blessing goes to the nation that will come from Abraham. And that nation, and it says, I will bless them that bless thee and curse him that curseth thee. And in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. This is a blessing or cursing that, uh, that not only is it clear from this text, but we're going to see that this same promise is made to Isaac and to Jacob and to Israel in general. The scripture repeats this. So when you have some Jew hater that comes along and says, ah, that's only Abraham, they're liars. They're, and they, they don't want you to know, they hope you don't know, that this same promise is repeated over and over. And, you know, you can see this in history. Um, uh, those who have blessed Israel have been blessed, and America up until recently uh, is an example of that. And people say, well, look at all the, we've suffered world war, and we've had all these things go wrong. God didn't say that you wouldn't suffer uh, the uh, uh, consequences of being in a fallen world, but you still are blessed over and above the trials of, of life and a lot of this that's happened to America, they brought on themselves. It's not God as much as man or American society cursing itself. But God has blessed Israel and anybody, or blessed America because of Israel and anyone who says otherwise is just an ignoramus. But if you want to see how that, he will curse them that curse the thee, comes down on America. You can get the book as America has done to Israel by John McTurnan. And I don't have a copy to show you here. I might be able to put up a screenshot. Um, but the the book, As America Has Done to Israel, shows that every time the American government policy has turned on Israel, America gets hit. Is it a coincidence? Maybe the first two or three dozen times, but after that you have to start to say, hmm, there might be something to this. And uh, look at the history of Rome, um, look at the history of Islam. Um, Islam has is, is never been a, a pretty sight, and only the very elite in the oil countries have ever lived, um, you know, above poverty during the reign of Islam. And there's only there's always just a tiny little slither. And people, spoiled brats in America, will say, well, that's true about America, too. And my answer is, no, it's not. The poorest of the poor in America live like many elites in other countries. It's because they're spoiled brats. They've had everything handed to them. They get a free education. And their food is provided by their parents. Uh, and they never have to work. Very few kids have to work until they, you know, decide they want to. You know, and that, that's not the reality of the rest of the world. And in Islam, you work from the time you're a child and you barely scrape to get by unless you're part of that elite class. And um, it's they, because they curse Israel. They are blinded spiritually with this false religion. Nazism the same way. Nazism, yeah, they had 
uh, a few years there where it looked like they were going to set up a utopian Third Reich, but uh, that blew up in their faces as they attacked and tried to genocide um, the, the Jews. And communism and so forth, the same case would be made. And there's always going to be ignoramuses who are going to argue against it, but those who have common sense can see um, that that is the case. And, and when the, verse 3 closes by saying, All families of the earth shall be blessed in thee, in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. Um, you know, you can just look what we talked about in uh, the previous verse, verse 2, with all the blessing of the, you know, the wealth and the innovations and the inventions and all that, and the hospitals and the, and the, um, you know, these Palestinians are trying to kill all the Jews, but any time any one of their people needs some major surgery, they, the Jews take care of them. It's an amazing thing to, to witness, and what's even more amazing are the Jew haters who live in denial of all that. But the ultimate blessing, of course, is Jesus Christ, the Messiah, a Jew who comes of uh, the stock of David um, through Nathan on his mother's side, and through Solomon on his father's, uh, his adopted father's side. So he has the, the right to uh, claim to be heir to the throne through Joseph, his adopted father, and he has the right as a genetic offspring in the lineage of David through his mother Mary. And um, that blessing belongs to anyone who will repent toward God with faith toward the Lord Jesus Christ. You can, you can actually experience that blessing but uh, most people just refuse. And so we continue verse 4, and it says, So Abram departed as the Lord had spoken unto him, and Lot went with him, and Abram was seventy and five years old when he departed out of Haran. Now, before you read that, and, and some of you may have obviously have read this before, but let's go back to the first time you ever read that. Didn't you expect him to be a little younger <laughs> when you read that? I mean, I knew the story that, you know, he's ninety-nine when Isaac's born, giving away the uh, you know uh, uh, story ahead of time, but most of you already know that. So when you read this, you kind of expect Abram to be you know thirty some, forty some years old, getting out away from his home and going. But he's seventy five years old when he's cutting out on his own. It's a pretty amazing um, fact, but you know age doesn't change the need for obedience. And uh, you, we have to trust God. We don't know. I'm 46 at the time of the you know, taping. I may not make 47. I don't know. I may make 50. I may make 60. I don't know. I may make 70. I'll, I hope and pray that the rapture happens before that. But uh, we don't know. And so we're 75 years old and God calls us to do something. He opens the door. You feel the prodding of the Holy Spirit, the leading. What do you do? Do it. You don't know. You may live another twenty years. You just don't know, and that's what Abram's doing here. Read the stories of Caleb and Moses and John the Beloved on the Isle of Patmos, around a hundred years old when he writes the Book of Revelation. And um, another key here is that Abram is hearing and he's doing. God blesses those who receive the word of God and do it. We read in James one twenty two. But be ye doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. I'm afraid there's a lot of people. I don't know. I'm not going to name names. I don't know. But I just have this sense that there are a lot of people, even who listen to our studies, who do a lot of listening and very little doing. And I have people, you know, wanting me to give them some wonderful advice and keys to happiness and how to have a wonderful life. Folks, you read the word. You allow the Holy Spirit to lead and guide you. You obey. It's that simple. Life's still going to have its troubles and trials, but if you won't do that, then you cannot, you will not um, be happy. You will not. It's like the Bible says, trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. That's the, uh, the hymn that says that, and it's absolutely true. It's based on Scripture. So verse 5 says, And Abram took Sarai his wife and Lot his brother's son, and all their substance that they had gathered, and the souls that they had gotten in Haran. So he's got some uh, staff now on board. And they went forth to go into the land of Canaan, and into the land of Canaan they came. They entered the land of Canaan, but don't forget, it belongs to God. It's, it's just being uh, accurate in saying that 
Canaanites are there, so it's known as the land of Canaan. But to the descendants of Ham, as Cain is, uh, Canaan is the descendants of, of Canaan. I want to make sure I pronounce that right. Canaan is the descendant of Ham. And according to Psalm 105, 23, I'll turn there real quick. Psalm 105, 23. Some of you all extra sensitive people out there might think I'm going to start preaching racism and I'm not. I'm just telling you what the Bible says. Um, it says Israel also came into Egypt. This is Psalm 105, 23. Israel also came into Egypt and Jacob sojourned in the land of Ham. Egypt and all of Africa is referred to as the land of Ham. I think it's again another verse here. Um, they showed, in verse 27, they showed his signs among them and wonders in the land of Ham. And that's talking about the uh, signs and wonders that Moses did in Egypt. In Psalm 106, 22 says, Wondrous works in the land of Ham and terrible things by the Red Sea. And that's where the Canaanites should have been. They were out of place. And it's again, it's not racism, it's a fact. And uh, Hamites have no more claim uh, on Egypt and Africa than do white people of Europe, the descendants of Shem, uh, or well, they're descendants of Japheth in Europe, the descendants of Shem who uh, include the descendants of Ishmael, the sons of Keturah, um, those Oriental groups. No, no one has a right to that land. God says it's his land and he gave it to the Jews. And uh, only descendants of Abram who became Abraham and Sarai who became Sarah have claim to this land at this point in the text and we're going to see that as we continue God narrows the field down as we go along. Um, verse 6 says, And Abram passed through the land unto the place of Sikkim in, unto the plain of Morah and the Canaanite was then in the land. And we don't really know where Morah was, is but we know it's in the land now known as Israel. Verse 7, And the Lord appeared unto Abram and said unto thy seed, uh, and said, Unto thy seed will I give this land. And there builded he an altar unto the Lord who appeared unto him. So again, God repeats, it's about land. And, uh, and Abraham, Abram at this point, responds by offering a sacrifice of blood. And that's, of course, going to weigh very importantly in our study as we continue. In verse 8, And he removed from thence unto a mountain on the east of Bethel, and pitched his tent, having Bethel on the west, and high on the east. And there he built an altar unto the Lord, and called upon the name of the Lord. And so there you see Abraham uh, showing his faith. Faith uh, without works is dead, James says, referring to Abram. And he's, he believes, and he offers a sacrifice of blood. And uh, then it says, verse 9, And Abram journeyed going on still toward the south. So that's where we're going to leave off. We'll pick up there. Abram crosses the Mason-Dixon line and goes to the south. Just joking. But we'll come back and have more to say about this. We have a lot more interesting stuff about this journey. And as we uh, will complete our study of Genesis chapter 12 next time. solid King James Bible preaching and teaching, along with the encouragement of the Psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, tune in to our internet radio station available every day, 24 hours a day, at bbfohioradio.com. Join listeners from over 150 nations, all 50 U.S. states, and other U.S. territories who are tuning in and receiving free Bible teaching at bbfohioradio.com.